Biden, in fact, was the uh, he was the founding, you know, brain behind this this whole thing of giving aid to Pakistan army, but with conditions. You know, there was a list of conditions, and the Pakistan army got absolutely furious. I mean, the whole story will come from Hussein Akani. You 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 would know that. So he knows his Pakistan, and at one time he also asked. I remember this. He says, "Why are we not bombing Pakistan?" Okay, U.S. is pulling out. But if things go wrong, they might just have to come back. There's a one word answer to all the troubles in Afghanistan. And that one word answer is Pakistan. You know, the Taliban are not quite as bad as, you know, you know, not just bearded mullahs. They're not what they were earlier. I'm sorry. They are exactly what they were earlier. They're worse. Russia is is busy pulling down President Ghani, as you know, they've, they've been really quite nasty about it which for us is a problem because we would like Russia to be you know the, the whole kind of togetherness which we once had hello everyone thank you for tuning in to hang out with bi this is Sri Ramaya and today we are hanging out with uh, two very special guests to discuss what's happening in Afghanistan uh, while we all remain consumed by the second wave of COVID-19 infections, there is a lot of other threatening things uh, happening around the world. Uh, those in the government will have to pay attention to what's happening both inside the borders, within the borders and outside it. And uh, therefore, it is, it is an important topic to discuss. Joe Biden has declared that America is going to pull out its troops starting May 1 to end America's longest war, uh, the one in Afghanistan. Sounds cool, right? Uh, except when US and NATO forces leave, uh, who's going to take charge? The chief of defense staff in India uh, said that he fears disruptors will take over America. Uh, if uh, we will take over Afghanistan, if America doesn't wait for a smooth transition of power. Um, simply put, he means to say the Taliban will take over. That Islamic military group with conservative values that ruled Afghanistan between 96 and 2001, gave refuge to terrorists like Osama bin Laden, and one of their folks in Pakistan shot the then 15-year-old Malala Yousafzai and so on and so forth. There are ghastly stories that, are, that have been told time and again. And India fears that there will be many more of that and that's not a good thing. India has spent a lot of time and money and effort to ensure that Afghanistan doesn't fall into the hands of Taliban and has been successful in gaining some goodwill as well among its people. Uh, but America never saw it like that. Donald Trump was brushing away India's concerns in February 2020 uh, where he said that, uh, why should I listen to India? Narendra Modi keeps telling me that I opened a library. What does that, how does that matter? Having said that, as we speak, um, you will see a list of India's efforts and investments in Afghanistan scrolling below um, while, while we speak to our guests. All of this is uh, aid is not charity for President Ashraf Ghani to be beholden to India. It is in our own self-interest that we've invested, invested so much. But all that may come to naught with this decision from Joe Biden. So to, to exactly tell us how it will hurt India, what the Narendra Modi administration could have done or can do here on uh, to ensure that the relationship with Kabul continues to improve and it remains a stable democratic country. Uh, we have with us two ladies who know a lot more about this than I do. Please join me in welcoming Tara Karta, who spent over 17 years in India's national security establishment before she retired as the director of military wing and we also have author and columnist Seema Sirohi who endlessly writes about this stuff and keeps watching it like a hawk. Thank you Tara and Seema for hanging out with BI. Um, Tara, I think many would argue that this was inevitable since the Doha agreement between the US and the Taliban which um, the American State De uh, Department described as an Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan which is not recognized by the United States. The point I'm trying to make is Donald Trump agreed to it and Biden is bound by it. It was so the only option for India is possibly to make peace with it, isn't it? Well, yeah, <clears throat> considering that uh, we are definitely not putting boots on the ground. So that at least so far, there is no such option available. So we have to accept what there is. And it was not unexpected. None of this is unexpected. After all, they've been there for 20 years. And that's a long time to expect any troops to function. How they did it, what, what they did, that's a different issue. But having, there is opportunity here for us as well. There is opportunity for everybody actually, because once you put that on the table, 
that the US troops are pulling out on such and such a day, a lot of people are going to start talking or fighting, which is also good. If they start, if the Taliban start fighting with each other, that's also good for us. So it's basically push the whole pace into a faster mode. Things are going to happen. It could slide back. But I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb, totally on a limb here and say that, OK, US is pulling out. But if things go wrong, they might just have to come back. So I'll, I'll just stop there, because they are, it's, it, this is not going anywhere fast. So you might find another pattern emerging where the US has to then come back and then you know do whatever it does. There's, there's China, there's Russia, there's Iran, there's Pakistan. There's far too many people involved. And this whole thing, unfortunately, unfortunately, the emphasis on Pakistan is so minimal in public. I'm hoping that in private they are going to they're going to sit on them and squash them and make them do something, but that has not happened so far. So in 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 intelligence analysis, you don't go by something which you know you don't you don't expect something unprecedented. It's never mm -hmm. happened. So therefore, in future, it will not happen. That's the that's the conclusion you take. So, so America is going away for now, but it might have to come back yeah. uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, that's a possibility. Uh, like Tara said, she's going out on a limb to say that. Seema, like Biden pointed out, like Tara is pointing out here today, the Afghan war was never supposed to go on for generations. Uh, but after two decades, I mean, the fact that today we are discussing that America still has to come back to keep Taliban in check, after two decades of being there, how did Taliban become so powerful uh, despite the best efforts from some of the world's you know, most powerful uh, militaries, uh, you know, administrations, as well as support from countries like India? Uh, you know, where are the money and the resources coming from? And I'm going to like feign such ignorance right now because I want you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a one word answer to all the troubles in Afghanistan. And that one word answer is Pakistan. I mean, we all know it. It remains one of the most enduring mysteries of international relations that why the United States didn't focus on Pakistan, instead kept you know, fighting the uh, war against the wrong country. The Taliban have uh, shelters in Pakistan. They get training from Pakistan. Pakistan has played this double game forever. So what is it? What is it that stops Americans from uh, facing this uh, very fundamental truth? Perhaps now that they're out of uh, Afghanistan, their troops will be back by um, uh, September 11th, fully and completely back home. Perhaps now is the time to actually take the bull by the horns and start sanctioning people in Pakistan and turn the screws on. Uh, that would be one way to sort of uh, get some justice not just for the Afghans, for their own soldiers, for God's sake. It's American soldiers who also died because of Pakistani duplicity. And uh, the generals of America, the Pentagon generals, I don't know why they wouldn't come close to the truth and they would always sort of give the Pakistanis a pass. Only one time. Did they come close to the truth when they said that uh, General Mike Mullen said that uh, the Haqqani network is the veritable arm of the ISI, the Pakistani intelligence agency. But then the Pakistanis threw a fit and it was back to uh, normal. You know, So uh, the Afghans are suffering. Everybody else in the neighborhood is going to suffer as the country uh, descends into chaos once again, because the Pakistanis, I don't think, are so smart and so adept at keeping the pot boiling at just the right temperature, meaning that they can control all these fundamentalist groups to just the right extent where they attack only the people Pakistan wants them to attack and not Pakistan itself. 
so the interesting bit is and, and i think i want to uh, sort of uh, at this point i think it will be relevant to quote uh, one the, the the initial agreement uh, between us and taliban um, where uh, the state department from the us are talking about the the statement that came from the state department of us uh, tara they, they made very specific talk of i'm combining the two points that both of you made one is us has to come back and two sanctions and uh, that state department statement itself spoke about uh sanctions right after uh you know um right after the troops are pulled off uh from afghanistan so so how is it going to play out any one of you whoever wants to jump in you been in terms of sanctions on pakistan to, uh, in terms of sanctions on taliban and of mm -hmm. course the sanctions would also arrive if taliban were not to keep uh its side of the promise of keeping afghanistan a, you know a better place to live in no it, it... the taliban have been pretty smart they have the agreement also includes us assistance mm -hmm. now you look at that so they know they can jump about all they want but they need us money to survive everybody wants that so in a way that i think the us hopes to use that as a leverage you know to to make them you know human rights blah blah my problem is this now i am going to take a little bit of uh, of uh, <laughs> you know into the us side mm -hmm. most us interlocutors have spoken to they, they will give me with this air that you know the taliban are not quite as bad as you know you know not just bearded mullahs they're not what they were earlier i'm sorry they are exactly what they were earlier they are worse if anything you know they are worse because they have this whole propaganda arm they have this social media arm which is giving us okay reasonably good image and that's sitting in pakistan it's not sitting in afghanistan it is over there the ones on the ground and this is from people who are reporting from the ground say they are if anything worse and why are we saying that because you've seen recently the targeted killings who are they killing they've got a list of people and most of them are women women who are heading the reconstruction efforts women who are going out there journals it's a targeted killing this is a very you know it's 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 something us is trying to uh, convince itself that the taliban which is there now is going to be okay so look what the peace agreement does it wants kabul to give up its power and come up it wants the taliban to give up its cultural you know, whatever lunacy and come up where is this going to go the optimism the optimism of uh, uh, of the naive variety exactly uh, it was naive to go to war in afghanistan to start with as well as in iraq and any other place from vietnam onwards uh, it is naive uh, for the us to pull off uh, with such uh, you know a sudden shock uh, for countries like india uh, you know you sort of not considering what your allies in the region you want india to be Uh, your ally in taking on um, uh, you know disruptive forces and that includes china so we've discussed pakistan afghanistan we've been, we discussed pakistan so let's get to china what is china's role what, the, there is an eerie silence from beijing uh, you know the conspicuous silence uh, seema what is it saying to us uh, in in the words that it's not using so now china will have to prove whether it is really ready for you know uh, the premier position in the world that it's so it's so eager to occupy so quickly it's in a hurry now let's see what it does i read one report that they will uh, they're supposed to send peacekeepers uh, to afghanistan we shall see they've had a free ride for 20 years uh and i might add if we are to be completely honest uh india also had a good ride india was able to do what it was under the us provided security cover uh, we should be uh, you know we should admit that so now the chinese uh, in collaboration with uh, with pakistan i'm sure will come up uh, with something the pakistanis will have to prove their worth um and uh, russians they're getting their sweet revenge you know the americans through you know, forced the soviet union out and uh, the way the when the soviets had invaded afghanistan now the russians are just basically watching and playing one uh, party against another 
and watching the Americans squirm, which is all, you know, in their mind is probably justified because back in the 80s, uh, the Americans were equipping the Mujahideen um, with rocket launchers and with anti-aircraft uh, guns, which basically spelt the doom for Soviet troops over there. Now it's for the Russians to sit and watch the game. And uh, we shall see how the Chinese play out. We well, don't I, know. I'm very tempted to ask uh, the risk of being a conspiracy theorist. Uh, you know, like, uh, like every other millennial today. Uh, is it, uh, are we go is, is this movie going to end with uh, Putin coming out as, a, as as the godfather that we didn't know about? <laughs> no, I, you know, just coming back to China for a minute. Mm. China is working through Turkey and Pakistan. Let's face it. They are keeping a very low profile. So all this Turkey conference is all about Chinese handling. But having said that, the Chinese are not all that happy that the US is leaving it. That means more trouble for them, you know, on the ground. This is this is not because they have more invested in that region than us. Not really. Not in Afghanistan. It's just promises. Nothing has really come out. So what I mean is the, the northern border of Pakistan, yes. you know. Yes. Yes. So so, so if things were to go haywire and out of their control, yeah. uh, the collateral damage will hit them before it hits us. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. And in terms of BRI itself, I don't think Afghanistan has really much of a role. They can do without Afghanistan, which is why they've kept their noses out. But uh, coming to Russia, Russia is is busy pulling down President Ghani, as you know. They've, they've been really quite nasty about it, which for us is a problem because we would like Russia to be, you know, the, the old kind of togetherness which we once had. That is not playing out for lots of reasons, which are another story altogether. But what I'd like to come back to is the fact that the when the CIA chief, in when he was in his testimony before uh, before on this issue, he said they are not the Pentagon and the intelligence services are not entirely happy about just backing up and leaving. They are saying very clearly that look, once we leave, our intelligence is going to be degraded because no matter. How much technology you have, you have to have boots on the ground. Your intelligence comes from the ground. That is one. Second, he also made the statement that regional countries are going to be in trouble. Meaning, all of us. I mean, I like to think that he, he was talking about us. What So, what can we do? We are now, you know, you had the Lavrov vis visit. You had, we didn't get called to Moscow. Okay, that, that which is okay. You had the Heart of Asia conference. And so, it, it's it's a it's a. Uh, I think that's a good point, Tara. What is it that India can do? What is it that India can, uh, you know, at this stage, uh, sort of uh, make an effort towards? Yeah, there's a very because right now there are too many cooks in the broth, right? Everybody is oh. having conferences, and the Taliban are having a ball because they're kind of going to every single capital and having a blast. That's different. What can we do is what we do best, which is we provided the development aid which you've talked of. But there's another thing we can do. You know, there's a very interesting report from SIGAR, which is the uh, the reconstruction people in the US. They are one of the few people who don't tell you what to do. They will just tell you what's, this is the picture. Now do what you want. In that, the critical element is to keep Kabul alive, you have to keep the Afghan army alive. Without that, that they are finished, you know. So you we don't want to send boots on the ground, okay. But the, the, the fact is, there is logistics, there is supply chain management, there is training. There's a host of things which we can do, not directly, through private firms. And whoever wants to go, and you don't even have to do it in country. You can do it you know, in a, in, in a separate fashion. You can work this out through a special arrangement. So that is something we are good at. Don't use your brawn, use your brains. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. So, but this needs to be quick because Sigar says the Air Force, for instance, the Afghan Air Force may last just about three months once the Americans withdraw. So, I'm pretty sure someone's thinking about all that. So, hopefully... Yeah, it's, it's, you, you're in US. Are people thinking about it, like Tara says? From what I read in from the statements by Secretary of State Blinken, 
uh, they are going to keep providing support because they know the last time where as soon as the Soviet support had stopped to President Najibullah, the government fell and all these uh, factions of Mujahideen came uh, fighting to Kabul. Um, so the same logic applies. As long as the Americans and the rest of the international community, NATO countries, etc., keep supporting Kabul and the government, they should survive. And I think the Americans should also shed this whole thing about not going beyond a certain level, you know, in uh, providing support to the Afghan. This is now pop culture joke. How Pakistan dupes America with its intelligence on, uh, you know, terrorism. No, it's more than it's more than duping. You see what uh, the game. You have to understand the game. So the domestic intelligence agencies argue with their own administrations that no, 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 let's not break relations uh, with Pakistan mm -hmm. because we are getting very important inputs. While uh, this whole thing is going on, they continue training every. Buddy, you know, to their madarsas are running, their training camps are running. So in this rigmarole of different allegiances, different desires, different uh, wants of different parts of government, it's a holy mess that the Pakistanis know how to exploit better than anyone else in this world, is what I would say. So, I don't so know if Sarah agrees, but uh, that's hundred <laughs> percent. I agree. <laughs> no, but, but I, I think the question that I was trying to ask is that common people like me, and then, like I said, if a stand-up comedian can crack a joke about it, why can't the U.S. administration call out and say, "Well, you are making us look like fools amongst our own people." No, in, in that sense, I, you know, you can actually expect more from Biden, you know, in, in the Obama administration, Biden, in fact, was the, uh, he was the founding, you know, brain behind this, this whole thing of giving aid to Pakistan army, but with conditions, you know, there was a list of conditions and the Pakistan army got absolutely furious. I mean, the whole story will come from Hussein Akani, you, you, you would know that. So he knows his Pakistan. And at one time, he also asked, I remember this, he says, why are we not bombing Pakistan? Hmm. So this is not a man who doesn't know his stuff. I am hoping that once the US has no longer has this dependence on Pakistan for his logistics, blah, blah, blah. There, there is a suggestion from some people that offshore, that they can have some kind of a structure offshore, that then they will turn the screws on Pakistan and make you have to isolate Pakistan. You have to isolate them so badly that until they are on their knees, they are not going to change. Because remember, they are consistent with Afghanistan policy, unlike us. Okay, we have gone up and down, up and down all the time. And the US, of course, wears all over the place. They have remained consistent for decades. You have to hand them that. One last question which I wanted to ask and I completely forgot. May I take your minute and say, what does this make India, uh, India's place in its neighborhood, right? So let's take a one uh, the South Indian word production and say one round around India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. Who are we friends with? Who are we not? What does what does this change the equation? You know, uh, in in the first past the post kind of way. Like, do we have more enemies than friends? Do we still have more friends than enemies? I think we are better off than we were before because we've got a good, very good relationship with Bangladesh. Sri Lanka is getting better. Maldives, of course, as you know now, is we are totally back on track with the Maldives. Nepal is a little shaky because of the Chinese presence there. But you know, if you if you disaggregate it, China hasn't really been able to do very much. You know, so we've got the handle over there. So it's not too bad. It, all of this could be better in ways which I am not going to go into now. Seema, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. No, I think I uh, agree with Tara uh, uh, on most of the points. Um, it could have been a lot better had 
we not, uh, you know, drop the ball like uh, gratuitously insulting the Bangladeshis. Our home minister did that. I mean, that was just pointless. Um, for domestic politics, you started to uh, sort of cause injury to foreign policy. That's just simply not done if you're a smart nation. Um, but I think our government tends to get very carried away with elections always. We are perpetually electioneering. And this is something that even the current Prime Minister Narendra Modi had lamented about in his early years. And he's definitely forgotten if the COVID uh, crisis is anything that has reminded us. Uh, he should remember that, uh, you know, elections come and go, governments come and go, prime ministers come and go. Uh, the people of India have to survive and we are they're all there in our service. And I think uh, on that note, uh, I will thank you both ladies for taking time out and joining us here. And I'm glad uh, we were still able to make a point about COVID while we are at it. But, uh, uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing so much of your experience, intelligence and insights on what's happening in Afghanistan. It matters for people who think, you know, it's so much so far away. In fact, Tara said we are one country removed, but it still matters. And uh, because <clears throat> what happens, I mean, all our ideas of nationalism are defined by our borders and it is at our doorstep. If there is trouble, it's trouble for us too. Thank you everyone who was watching. This is Sri Rama here signing off.